I want you to know that my relationship with God through Jesus Christ is the most important thing in my life. Everything in my life revolves around what I know about God and what he's done in my life. That it's not just some philosophy, it's not just some idea. The living God has entered a love relationship with me and it's overwhelming. And yet, there are many in America today who have disregarded the Bible and are walking away from God. And I look around America and I I ask myself the question, how did we get here? How have we begun to wander away from the center of our life? Well, you look back in history and you go back to the early 18th century, there was the age of reason, which tried to remove everything that it considered unreasonable. And of course, God and miracles and faith were unreasonable. The Enlightenment came and used science as a test to prove of what was really true. Of course, faith could not be tested by science, and so it was cast out as some kind of tale created for the poor and the uneducated. The Industrial Revolution came, radically transformed everything about the world and society. I mean, new economic realities, new social change, materialism grew and pragmatism ruled and the church again just seemed old fashioned. The information age, the digital revolution that is currently going on is overwhelming us with every sinful temptation at your hands, every worldly philosophy in this unreal world of of AI and video games, and yet, the Bible remains. Not as some kind of ancient relic, but as the timeless Word of God. God's Word does not change with human advancement. Truth is truth for all time. And the power of the gospel to change lives is the living testimony to that truth. I don't know about you, but I believe because he's done something deep into the heart of my life, and I will never again be the same. So today, as a church, and as the church around the world, we celebrate the miracle of Christmas. Well, this, uh, this December season, we're in a sermon series called Believe the Unbelievable, that Christmas does not make sense to the unbelieving world as if we could examine God under a microscope or maybe understand the ways of an infinite being with a finite mind. And while we seek knowledge of the universe by by sending spacecraft 34 million miles to collect rocks on Mars, the creator of this universe has already spoken. Jesus willingly came to earth born of a virgin, died for our sins, because God so loved the world. Well, the sermon today is the Immaculate Conception. We've read the story already in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 through 25. That Christmas story is not some kind of holiday lore. It is biblical history. And the birth of Jesus is just as significant as the death of Jesus. Now, now, rightfully so, we talk often about the cross and the resurrection, but listen, the coming of Jesus, how he came, the birth of Jesus is just as significant in the gospel story as his death. The angel said to Joseph, Mary will bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And behold, the virgin shall be with child, bear a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, because that means God with us. Well, the first thing I want you to see in our passage is that the virgin birth was fulfilled prophecy. In this passage, there's a unique statement. And for some reason, it just kind of jumps out at me. It's verse 22 and 23. It says, almost in passing, it says, so all this was done 
that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying. Now, Matthew is basically saying that because it was prophesied, it must come true. That because God himself encountered Isaiah and he spoke a promise, and because God is sovereign over all things, God would see to it that his promise would be fulfilled. Because whenever God speaks, it is done. When God speaks into our life, there's no turning back. Every promise in the word of God is guaranteed by the character of God himself. If God speaks it, he's going to be true to his word. And I I don't know about you, but I'm comforted to know that I can count on God's promises in my life. I can trust the word of God. Because when God speaks, he's God. He is not controlled by any force outside of himself. He will fulfill that which he has proclaimed. But can you imagine the couple through whom he will fulfill his promise? Like God lives on this plane where he's in absolute control of all things, sovereign over the universe, but we live on this fallen world and we we can't quite seem to grasp the, uh, the, the, the amazing capacities of God. And so the couple through whom he would fulfill his promise Can you imagine how they'd respond? Joseph didn't believe. He couldn't get in his mind that this was absolutely true. He planned to put Mary away secretly and abandon the marriage because the only explanation for her pregnancy was that Mary had been with another man. Now, in the Jewish world, engagement was equivalent to marriage except that a man and a woman do not live together. They they, they were called husband and wife, and at the end of the engagement, the marriage was consummated, but if in the engagement the woman became pregnant, it was considered adultery. You see, this was a serious matter. And and I imagine Mary trying to explain, can 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 you picture yourself as Mary? Trying to explain to Joseph, by the way, my betrothed, I'm pregnant, but don't worry, I've not been with another man. How crazy would that sound? But of course, that's impossible. It did not make sense to human reasoning. His mind could not believe that Mary was still a virgin. How could he believe that which is unbelievable? Listen, the virgin birth makes no sense to human reasoning, but it makes perfect sense in the mind of God. That's why an angel came to Joseph. It was unbelievable. There's no way he would believe Mary because it was impossible. He had to have somebody else come and explain it to him. So God sent an angel to come. Because with God, nothing is impossible. He sent a messenger from God, a messenger from heaven to come down and say, I know this doesn't make any sense, but listen, the things on earth are not like the things in heaven. Nothing is impossible with God. The one who speaks and things happen that the natural world cannot understand. You see, it would take a messenger from God to convince him. In verse 20, it says, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Joseph found himself right in the middle of a miracle, the incarnation of God. But Mary also struggled. In the Gospel of Luke, it tells the story of Mary's encounter with the angel Gabriel. And Luke makes it very, very clear. There's no doubt. And of course, Luke was a physician. He was a doctor, a medical person. He wanted to make sure everyone understood she was really a virgin. Luke 1:27, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. He wanted to make sure everyone understood what was going on here. And here's what the angel said. 
And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus. And Mary's reply was very honest. In verse 34, it says, how can this be? Let, let, me, let me translate that for you. You're crazy. <laughs> what are you talking about? Th this cannot happen. I don't know a man. I've never been with a man. And listen to the angel's amazing statement. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. I want you to know that God is not limited, limited by the laws of nature, which he created. Everything he does is a miracle. Everything he does is God-sized. He's not limited like you and I. We think of that it's impossible. That's not how nature works. He created nature. He, he can override it anytime he wants. And again, only an angel could convince Mary and Joseph to believe. But I, I still, in my mind, I have this imagination of Mary and Joseph uh, coming together and sharing their encounters with angelic beings. I don't know, perhaps they sat by a fire and just stared at each other. What is going on? How did we find ourselves in this amazing story? Perhaps they embraced each other just with trembling arms, not even knowing how to speak. And perhaps the scriptures began to rush into their mind. All of their hearing, all of a sudden, the, the scriptures they'd learned since childhood are rushing back to their remembrance, and it's starting to make sense as they began to think through the words of Isaiah. The virgin shall be with child. Now, you need to understand that the Jewish people, they memorized the scriptures from childhood. I mean, they, it was an amazing thing. It was a part of who they were. It was their culture. It was their education. Everything in their life was based on the scripture, and so they would memorize it. They didn't have Bibles to carry around everywhere they went. They memorized the scriptures. And of course, Isaiah is one of the most uh, famous prophets, and one of the most famous scenes in the Old Testament is found in Isaiah chapter 6. And the Jewish people, their, their imagination was just zoomed in on this passage. They would have known the scripture which says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. I, I mean, listen, throughout Old Testament history, you can't look upon the Lord and live. And yet somehow Isaiah was given this vision where he saw God in all of his glory. He said, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me. I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Can you imagine how the Jews loved Isaiah? You saw that. He saw God in all of his glory. Do you understand why they studied such a great book? And I guarantee you they would have read the very next chapter in that same book in Isaiah 7, 14, which said, Behold, a virgin will be with child. Words written maybe 700 years earlier had been imprinted into Mary's mind. Words that she had been taught all of her life. Can you imagine that moment that she realized the prophet Isaiah was talking about her? Can you imagine that moment when this realization, what we all studied in school, this great prophecy, it's me, the one who saw the Holy One sitting on his throne also would prophesy of his coming to earth the absolute wonder of it all. And the Bible simply has this statement, Mary pondered these things in her heart. <laughs> I bet she did. I bet she stayed up late at night pondering 
What in the world? Why me? The virgin birth was promised by God, prophesied by Isaiah, and fulfilled through Mary. But the second thing, the virgin birth was necessary for our salvation. For us to be saved, the virgin birth was absolutely necessary. It is critical. It could not happen without the virgin birth. That this impossible idea was made possible because there is no other way for us to be saved. Now remember, Jesus existed before Mary and Joseph. Jesus existed before the worlds were formed, before time itself. And the way in which Jesus came to earth was necessary for several reasons. First of all, the virgin birth was necessary for God to break the power of sin. The virgin birth was necessary. It was was critical to break the power of sin because Jesus did not have a human father. He did not inherit Adam's sinful nature. Romans 5.12, it says that through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all have sin. That sin nature that we all struggle with came because we are descendants of Adam. And when sin entered through his life, all mankind, everybody would also be tainted with that sinful nature. But Jesus was not tainted by the seed of Adam. Jesus was the spotless lamb of God who would be our holy sacrifice for sin. That Jesus became the new Adam, the new beginning, the only one who could save us from sin through his sacrificial death on our behalf. Romans 5, 19. For as by one man's disobedience, Adam, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, Jesus, many will be made righteous. You see, the virgin birth broke the chain of sin passed down from Adam. That finally, there was one who was not corrupted by sin, the holy son of God. But, but also, the virgin birth was necessary for God to provide a savior. See, God did not just shout down from a distant heaven, hey, I love you down there. No, he came down to earth, and he loved us face to face. Remember what the angel said to Mary? The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, that Holy One that's going to be born is going to be called the Son of God. His birth could not be like any other birth. He was born of the Spirit of God. In other words, God did not just send another messenger, another prophet, another king, No, this time he got up off his throne and said, I'm coming down there. Emmanuel means God with us. And when fallen humanity could not overcome sin, God satisfied his own righteous demands and he paid a price that we could not pay. But there's another reason why the virgin birth was so important. The virgin birth was necessary for God to provide a substitute for humanity. Jesus was fully God. And he was fully man. He was born of Mary. He had flesh and blood. You see, he could not take our place unless he first took our condition. So Jesus took on flesh that he might redeem all flesh. And when I think about this virgin birth, I I just think about how much God loves us. He knows our condition. He took on flesh and he walked this earth. He understands us. He knows the weight of our sin because he carried that sin on his shoulders. He knows the only way for us to be free because he is the one who died on the cross to set us free. He knows our future. He's gone before us to prepare a place. I mean, it doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, the virgin birth was necessary to cover your sin. 
Jesus came to save the lowly sinner. And he also came to save the high and the lofty sinner. He came to earth and he found that the high priest and the harlot were equally lost. They both needed a savior. And today, if you are somehow frustrated by religion, you're actually in good company, because so is Jesus. God had created us for a love relationship with him, but religion had turned this relationship into a bunch of rules. And people were stumbling over the rules and never actually got to the relationship. The religious leaders of that day, they no longer were asking the question, how can I know God? How can I walk with God? How can I love God? They weren't asking those kind of questions. They were asking, how can I avoid evil? How can I keep myself away from everyone who's unclean? How can I separate myself from a dark and fallen world? How, and, and so they would avoid sinners everywhere they went. They didn't want to be corrupted or tainted or get around or associate with lowly sinners. They were all about avoiding people broken in sin. But not Jesus. Aren't you glad? Jesus came for people caught in sin. He didn't avoid them, he got involved in their lives. He hung around tax collectors and fishermen and harlots and the demon possessed, the very worst of society, and he gave them life, he gave them dignity. In fact, one of his nicknames was, he's a friend of sinners. And aren't you glad? That means he's your friend, and he's my friend. That Jesus left the perfection of heaven, came to a fallen world, dark and full of evil. Why? Because Jesus loves you. He chose to get involved in your life. He knows you are a sinner, and he knows you need a savior. Jesus came to save us from our sin and to change us to the very core of who we are. And I want you to hear this. The change in us is what convinces people to believe the unbelievable. They ought to look at your life and say, that is unbelievable. What God has done in you, the way you treat people, the way you see this world, the way you live your life, the way you invest your life, what happened to you? Because you're not acting like the world around, something in you has changed. You know, a few days ago was December 7th. What's December 7th known for? It's Pearl Harbor Day, the day we remember the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Well, on the screen, you'll see a picture of the USS Arizona. It's burning after the attack. It was a horrific day in American history. 19 naval ships were destroyed or severely damaged, including eight battleships. 2,403 personnel died on this attack. Well, there's a man named Matsuo Fushida. He was the Japanese pilot who led the attack. This was the man who led the attack on Pearl Harbor. One of the most, he became one of the most notorious villains in American history. The surprise attack, this is the man who led that attack. Well, the next picture you'll see the bomber that he actually flew. It's, uh, you can see it kind of shot up and is damaged. This was the Japanese bomber that carried out such a daring raid that took so many American lives. Well, he was trained by the Samurai Code. And, and it, it simply means that he was trained, that, that, that he was demanded to have hatred and revenge upon all of Japan, Japan, Japan's enemies. And the day of the attack, he would gather his fellow airmen and he made this statement, he said, it is our duty to annihilate the enemies of Japan. This is our duty, annihilate our enemies. Well, he, he became a Japanese hero. In fact, he's one of the very, very few people who ever had the privilege to meet the emperor of Japan because of his, his, his uh, success. But something changed in his life. Several miracles caused him to question the meaning and the purpose of life. Well, you see a picture of Hiroshima. Well, he was in Hiroshima on August 5th, 1945, 
The very next day, his hotel was vaporized by the first of two atomic bombs that America dropped on Japan. He lived, but those attacks ultimately caused Japan to surrender. And with his homeland ruined, he found himself with no purpose. And he began to wonder why his life was even spared. But what ultimately changed his life, radically changed his life, was two American Christians. One was a prisoner of war, and one was a nurse. Well, here's Jacob DeShazer. He he was a pilot in the Doolittle Raid on Tokyo, April 1942. You know the Doolittle Raid? A famous raid. It was a chance for America to try to hit at the heartland of Japan because they were so isolated, they're so far away. How do we actually strike their homeland and let them know that they're not vulnerable to our attacks on their land? Well, he was chosen as, a, as one who would fly one of 16 B-25 bombers that would be the very first to drop a bomb on the homeland of Japan itself. But here's the problem. What made the attack so daring is that the bombers Of course, they're big and heavy. They need a long runway to take off, but these planes would be taking off from a short runway on an aircraft carrier. They had to lighten everything up. They had to try to do everything to make the plane lighter so it would take off. They had to get the aircraft carrier heading into the wind as fast as it could to try to get these huge bombers off the the, the landing there. And so it took a great daring. They didn't know that it could be done, but they did it. The raid was a success. But DeShazer was captured and spent 40 months in a Japanese prison being tortured and mistreated. But while he was there, he somehow got his hands on a Bible and he was saved. He was gloriously saved. He began to pour over this Bible of what God would have him to do. And he read in his Bible that he has been called to love his enemies. And he began to love the very ones who tormented him. The guards couldn't believe it. The guards were overwhelmed. In fact, the guards were so taken back by this incredible love of a prisoner of war that they began to treat him like a brother. Fushida heard of this man who loved his enemies. It made no sense to his samurai training. But there's another person. It was a nurse. Peggy Koval also played a part in this story. Her missionary parents were actually killed by the Japanese. But she chose to serve as a nurse to Japanese prisoners of war. And she began to treat those prisoners of war, these Japanese prisoners, with kindness and with respect. She became known among the Japanese prisoners as the angel among them who loved their enemies. Well, one of the men who she cared for and that she treated well was the engineer who maintained Fushida's plane. And he would later go back to Japan and tell Fushida that the lady who took care of him loved her enemies. Well, to make a long story short, and there's so many other details I could go into, to make a long story short, Fushida was so impacted by the love of a prisoner, the love of a nurse, that he sought out these ones who had loved their enemies. And Fushida uh, and the American prisoner became friends, and he was led to Christ. He got saved. He was so radically changed that he spent the remaining years as an evangelist, preaching the gospel all over the world, including in America, the place that he once hated. And for the rest of their lives, enemies lived as brothers in the family of God. Love conquered hate. Love conquered hate. Christmas is the story of God's love. That while we were enemies of God, Christ died for the ungodly. He died for us. It's unbelievable, but it's true. And now we are called to love others just as God has loved us. The scripture says the world will know that we are Christians. How? by our love. And it all started with the virgin birth where God came to earth. He got involved in our lives. He came to the fallen, the broken, 
the rebellious. He came to save those who were enemies of God. And today we celebrate the miracle, the unbelievable. We celebrate the virgin birth of Jesus. And it reminds us that salvation comes from above. It is initiated by God himself, that God's love came to us. And because of Jesus, there is now hope for every last person that walks this earth. And we, as children of God, reflecting the nature of God, love everybody in the name of Jesus, that they too might believe the unbelievable. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that this Christmas season, we can know without a question of a doubt that we are loved by Almighty God. We are loved so much that you would send your only son to live and die and be resurrected that all who would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Father, I thank you that that love that came to us while we were enemies of God, in rebellion to God. Father, I pray that it would so change us that no matter where we go, no matter who we encounter, that they would sense the love of God in us. No matter what we're going through, there's a God who cares. No matter what trials we face, no matter how broken we are, no matter how much we've done to offend you and offend others, that there is hope in Christ. And only in Christ will it be well with our soul. In a dark and weary land, there is peace with God. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.